Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents, and I welcome you to God's Church of Love online. We are getting ready to have our Saturday service, and we're talking about edifying, edification. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and, excuse me, the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity therein, meaning the Jews and the Jews who are the followers and people of God, the true people of God, and born-again Christians are both one. There is no partition anymore. There's no more Jew and Gentile. We are one. So we don't have to refer to ourselves as Jew and or Gentile. We can just refer to ourselves as the people of God. One holy race called by his name, called out of shame, called out of darkness, Anyway, let me move on. Back to the word. And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were not. For through him, we both have access. Listen to that. Through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, let me stop there too. Many of you think you have to go through a minister, a priest, or a um, uh, uh, I don't know what you call them, but all these different names that we have for leaders of churches, you can go to God right through yourself. You can talk to God. You can minister to God. You, the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace. You need help, go to God. You need answers, go to God. You have questions, ask God. You don't have to go through another human being to get to God. Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father, but by me. He didn't say, but by the priest. 
He didn't say, but by the pastor. No, he said, but by me. We come to God through Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. So you don't need someone else to partition for you. You don't need to go to confession. You talk to God, confess your faults to God. Now, when you confess your faults to one another, you pray for one another that you may be healed. That's the body of Christ. That's not people in ministry. That's just brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, which we are one now, the people of God. All right, moving right along. Okay, verse 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly, this is the key line right here, fitly formed or fitly framed together, growing unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, all that is basically saying our togetherness, our giftings and callings, everything God made up in our lives, we are put together to grow together, to edify one another, to build each other up in the most holy faith. Hmm. And God be in our habitation through his Holy Spirit. Now, what happens is a lot of times as we walk with the Lord, we don't realize that we are so connected. When Jesus speaks of the body of Christ, he refers to hands, arms, legs, limbs, head, mouth, eyes, ears. He refers to the body. Can the eye say to the hand, I have no need of thee? No, the eye needs the hand. The hand needs the eye. Do you hear what I'm saying? We are members one of another. We are fitly joined together, compacted together by that which every joint supplieth. So every uh, Rashad supplies to me. I supply to Lynn. Lynn supplies to Andrea. Andrea supplies to Marlene. Marlene supplies to me. Marlene supplies to Rashad. Lynn supplies to me. Lynn supplies to Rashad. I mean, it's just a constant ongoing connection. We are totally connected in a supernatural format. We don't really get how connected we really are. And that's why we must love each other because we need each other. You cannot tell the hand, I have no need of thee. There's not one person in the body of Christ. I don't care how imperfect they are. There's not one person in the body of Christ that the body of Christ doesn't need. And we are the body of Christ. You and I are the body of Christ. Now, when God hooked you and me together, he was forming an orchestra, a harmony. And a lot of times what we see in the body of Christ or people, I've seen it in churches, the disrespect, the contempt that people have for each other. What broke my heart one time, really broke my heart, and the man made it public and I had to bring it out. He spoke against other denominations as if they were going straight to hell because of their erroneous beliefs. And I told him, I said, he, he made the mistake of asking, opening up the discussion for questions. So I asked him a question. I said, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? 
And he's kind of befuddled because he doesn't really know where I'm going with the question. So he gives the obvious answer. And I said, well, if you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, I said, why are you right now encouraging this particular group to look down at other groups as if they have been discounted because of their error? I said, do you realize that nobody has the last word on the word? Which means whether you belong to them and that group and the other group, or whether you belong to this group, there is error because the Bible says we know in part. We prophesy in part. Everything we do is in part until we're changed. Like in a twinkling of an eye, we will not know all, not yet. So wouldn't it behoove you to encourage us to be in unity with one another rather than to be at odds? Don't you think you're encouraging schisms in the body, which Jesus vehemently spoke against? Oh, that man got irate. Oh, he turned every shade of red he could turn. And then other people tried to comfort him with, uh, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe um, so-and-so, I kind of see a point, blah, blah, blah. They were trying to soft pedal and patty cake that bad boy. I was done. But I had to comment because he made the mistake of opening it up. And I couldn't sit there and listen, and listen to him bashing our brothers and sisters in Christ because he didn't agree on a particular topic. There, you're going to have born-again Christians that believe in the millennium. You're going to have born-again Christians that don't believe in the millennium. You're going to have born-again Christians who believe in the uh, post-millennium. You're going to have born-again Christians that believe in... Uh, uh, the tribulation. Then you're going to have people who believe we're going to be out of here before the tribulation. Then you're going to have people that think we're going to be here three and a half years into the tribulation before the real nitty gritty breaks loose. So trust me, we all know in part. So quit fighting each other and quit looking down on each other like you are the last word on the word, like you are the the uh, the one with the expertise, the one with the divine knowledge, the divine insight that no one else has, that your movement, your group is the ultimate, that you are the chosen. No, baby, the only thing that makes you chosen is that you're born again and you're obeying God, period. As I said in the video last night, or the night before last. Don't let your high and mighty ways turn your head. Leave that hinky butt style down the road. God doesn't have time or space for it in the body of Christ. So when you start thinking that you are holier than thou, holier than them, holier than those over there, guess what? Back your truck up. Sit your behind down and sit at Jesus' feet and learn what he has to say. Schisms in the body. No, no, we don't have time for that. These are the last days. Time is winding up. It's time for us to get together, not come further apart. Pointing the finger. Oh my goodness. It's a it's an unholy shame the way we talk about each other. Do you know? I know you're gonna look at me like I'm cockeyed and I'm not going off. But I want to share this with you. When you read in Revelations. And he talks about the people, the body of Christ. He talks about the different churches. And he talks about some churches like they are totally jacked up, messed up from the flow up, toe up. But he mentions there are a few. There is a remnant in you. Mm -hmm. And that remnant's in a good place. They know what's up. Well, I found that to be true with Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, don't throw the tomatoes yet. Hear me out. I had a customer who used to come and sit in my chair. Now, I don't know how long she was a Jehovah's Witness. I really don't know. She may not have known the difference. I don't know that either. 
But one thing I do know, when she came, we could feel the presence of God. She would talk about God with all this love. And she would talk about the time when she gave her heart to the Lord and she accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Mm. She knew he was the divine son of God. She didn't have any problems with that. She knew she needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And boy, when she was filled with the Holy Ghost, she even spoke in tongues. I didn't even have that. I didn't have that till years after I got saved. I was filled with the Holy Ghost experiencing his love, prophesying and giving words of exhortation. But the tongues gift hadn't come till later on. With her, that's what she had initially. She was so filled with the Holy Spirit, we both felt elated when we were around each other. There was no question. It witnessed in my spirit that she was a child of God. It witnessed in her spirit that I was a child of God. And see, Jehovah's Witnesses look down on us and we look down on them. I mean, that's just the way it goes. But let me tell you, God knows who his people are. So don't you discount a person if they're in what you call the wrong movement. Don't discount them because you ain't God. You don't know. You can't put a person in hell and you can't keep them out of heaven. So don't try it. You just love them. And if they say they're a born-again Christian, you take them at their word. She was living a holy life, y'all. She wasn't half-stepping like some of the born-again Christians that were going to my church. Hmm. So don't be so quick to point the finger. Don't be so quick to tell people, oh, you can't be saved. No, 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 no. You're not saved. No. You leave that for God to determine. Even when the disciples had a hissy fit, Listen to this. The disciples had a hissy fit because <laughs> they saw a man down the road somewhere preaching Jesus and he had all the doctrines all screwed up. Jesus said, leave him alone. If he's not against me, he's for me. Either way, the gospel's being preached. Leave him alone. We need to have that attitude. Mind your business. What are you doing for the Lord? Worrying about what they're doing wrong. What are you doing? What are you doing right? Hmm. Now, let's move on to the body of Christ as a membership. Now, here you go to the same church. Now, we dealt with them over there and them over there. Now, let's deal with us-ins right here. Hmm. Yeah. Now, I've seen people in the church, hmm, hmm, hmm. the choir members, the choir members putting down and talking, making snide remarks to the pianist. I've seen the, the choir director make little snide cutting remarks to the choir members. They're to rehearse and, and their little attitude, I don't know if they're on the rag or what, but all of a sudden, boy, Jack jumps out the box and stays out during the whole rehearsal. And we're sitting up here trying to rehearse and we got to rehearse through all this nasty attitude and not talk back. Now, let me tell you this. There are going to be people in the body of Christ that you have a hard time working with. You might be the choir director and your pianist might have a personality that drives you up the wall that works your last nerve. Well, the Lord gave me two examples last night and I want to share this with you. This is how the body of Christ works, how it's supposed to work. You get a soldering gun. Now, some of you, some of you may not know what a soldering gun is, but you take a soldering gun. It's like a little miniature welder. It uses extreme heat to bond metals together with a soldering stick. And the soldering stick is the glue. It's a metal, softer metal, but when it locks in and it cools down, you almost can't break that baby off at all unless you do it with a hammer. Now, a lot of people use them for electrical work. My father used to work on, on TV, on, on the old uh, tubes that were inside of a television box. And he'd take the box off, pull the tube out, and you turn it backwards, and you see all these electrical tubes and components back there, and these circuits. And he would take his soldering gun, and he would take... Uh, the, the soldering stick and he lay it against 
uh, uh, an item that he wants to attach to a circuit and he would add the heat and that stick would begin to melt and mold around that and he'd attach the thing that he wanted attached to it and he would hold it there. Now the heat was red, white, hot. It was extremely hot. And if you could imagine the body of Christ, listen to this, I'm trying to paint a picture. You've got a person, they're the circuit, the soldering gun. Hmm. That's the situation. Yeah, we got a situation. Now, the person getting on their nerves is over here, getting ready to be attached because they got to work together. They got to lead the choir together. They got to do the usher board together. They on, they're on the board together. They're on the planning committee. Whatever the case is, they're in there working elbow to elbow and they almost can't stand each other. Hmm. So much for loving one another and edifying one another, right? Okay, so here they are with this soldering process. And you've got the person being burned. That's what's happening. This is hot. Hot is uncomfortable. So the soldering gun is attached, is attaching the, the stick to this person. Imagine the person as the circuit, the circuit board. Okay, so they're being attached there. Now, then they attach the other person that gets on their last nerve. And they got to stand there. And they're holding hands while the soldering gun is there. And they want to pull apart. Oh, it's hot. It's hot. Wait, let me go. No, no, no. I don't like this. I don't want to hold his hand. I don't want to hold. And they're just pulling and at odds and looking and rolling eyes and sucking teeth and attitude flying off the wall, bouncing off the chandeliers. But if they're obedient, in spite of how they feel about each other, they stay there. And while they stay connected, the Holy Spirit comes and cools. Cools, brings down the temperature. And they have to stay in place for a minute. And once that temperature cools down to a certain level, the bond is solid. And all that has transpired through that process is arguing and fussing and rolling eyes and getting mad at each other and, and, and having to forgive each other and having to try to get along and get the job done. And the next thing you know, because they're bonded and they're working so close, they're getting to know each other and understanding starts to rise in the middle of chaos. Insight and sensitivity begins to come to the surface. And before you know it, that bond has formed a new level of love between what could have been two rival enemies. If you stay put, I don't know what body of Christ you're working with, but if you stay put, your pastor might be your last nerve. Your pastor might be your sore spot. The choir director, the usher leader, I don't know who it is, but whoever you're working with in the body of Christ, you stay connected and you don't put each other down. You edify each other, compliment each other when you don't want to even say hello. Tell each other you did a good job. I appreciate your faithfulness. I appreciate your service to the Lord. Fake it till you make it, baby. And as you pray and ask God to shower your heart with more love, that soldering process that was first painful, aggravating, irritating, annoying, and ah, will turn out to be, huh, you're not so bad after all. Wow, I didn't know that about you. Why well, you do this so well? Oh, you have such a good heart. I never would have seen that if I had never worked so closely with you. And time goes on and the love grows and blossoms and solidifies. And you can't break that bond. Satan can't break the bond with all his demon hammers hammering at it. He can't even break the bond. Sometimes your worst enemy will become your greatest ally if you stay. Connected. Don't allow the devil to wedge 
division between you. Don't allow the devil to form schisms and fractures all through the body. Don't allow that. You have to guard your heart and guard your brothers and sisters' hearts too. Be very careful. Mm -hmm. Give you something to think about, huh? You know who you're thinking about. Yeah. See, sometimes a good stand is better than a bad run. Some of y'all run from church to church, church hopping. One person gets on your nerves there, you out of there. You go to another church, somebody gets on your nerves there, you out of there. You're going to just hopping, doing bunny hop. You're just going all over the place. Hopping your little behind dizzy. Like the road runner. I mean, anyway, so think about it. Think about the soldering process. The heat is necessary. Iron sharpens iron, correct? The heat is necessary to begin the bonding process. And the bonding process may include arguments and <coughs> flare-ups and all of that. Just go with it, baby. <coughs> Nobody, <coughs> excuse me, nobody in the body of Christ is perfect, including you. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Yeah. Well, anyway, so moving right along. Now, the other example, Lord, bring it back to my mind. You know how old I am. The other example, the Lord gave me. The Lord reminded me of a game I had in a classroom. <laughs> and in this game, this is how we are to rally around each other as we edify one another. In this game, this classroom was a special ed class. I was the teacher aide. And the teacher who was teaching the class did a whole bunch of paperwork. She didn't really get up in front and teach them. She would just do a bunch of paperwork. That's the way special eds were directed back then. I don't know why. Don't ask me. I don't know. Anyway, so I'm feeling sorry for the kids because there is no stimulus whatsoever. Other than mischief, there is no stimulus. And uh, the, the teacher has to go off for jury duty. Now listen to this example the Lord gave me. The only ones as the substitutes were teachers on their conference hour. So I was mainly the one doing the teaching while she was gone. <clears throat> and every test they got, they got B, uh, excuse me, C's, D's, and F's. Nobody got A's and B's, just C's, D's, and F's. Okay. The Lord, I asked the Lord as I was going up front, because I believe in teaching. I don't believe in shoving paperwork in kids' faces. I said, Lord, show me how to drive this point home to them. Now, this is a point I'm driving to you for another reason. For them, it was to learn about how the body works, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the harmful bacteria. Now, <clears throat> what God showed me is picture the body of Christ. Now, you can try to imagine what the kids did, but I had the... The, a bunch of kids that said, who wants to be the the red blood cells? And they raised their hands. I said, who wants to be the white blood cells? They raised their hands. So I had the red blood cells stand in the center. And we moved all the deaths out of the way. And I had all the white cell kids stand in a circle around them, locking hands or locking arms like elbow to elbow. And I had them join up, hook up and lock up like that. Now, the germ was Patrick. Patrick was the mischievous kid in the class, so I picked him to be the germ since he was the bad boy. And uh, so he, I said, Patrick, you got to try to break into the circle. You can't go under. You can't climb over. You have to break through. And I said, now, everybody, I want you to face Patrick because I didn't want them going against their bones, so I wanted them to go where they can bend and give. So they all faced outwardly outside the circle and their backs were to the red, the, the kids in the center playing the red blood cells. 
The white blood cells are the protectors. So they stand out there holding arms. And Patrick is trying to break through and break through and break through. And everybody was so good, he never got to break through once. And I said, now, because you have protected the red blood cells, the red blood cells will be all right. So the reds and the whites, we are the winners. Patrick, you lose. And we all fell out laughing. He had a good time being the bad one. So my point to you in picturing that, now when they took the test, they all got A's, B's, and C's because they knew what it meant about the red blood cells and the role the white blood cells played and the germ and all of that. Okay. So my point to you is picture the germ as the devil. Picture the germ as life's circumstances, trials, problems, uh, I irritants. Picture the germ as emotional scars. Picture the germ as your hangups, your insecurities, all of that. Picture the germ as, as uh, discord happening in the body of Christ. Picture the germ as, as uh, gossip going around, slandering people, causing all kind of, of uh, unrest in the body. Mm-hmm. Are you going to be a white blood cell? Hmm? Or are you going to join with the germ? Are you going to join with the harmful bacteria? Are you going to protect the body of Christ and speak up against backstabbing, backbiting, gossiping, disrespectful treatment? Hmm? Or are you going to hang out with the germ because you like the mischief, you like the gossip, you like drama, it's entertaining to you? Which one are you going to be? The one that, that keeps the body protected or the one that helps tear it apart? Which role do you play? Are you the germ or the white blood cell? Huh? The body of Christ are the reds. They're in the center. And you're the prayer warrior. You're the, the leaders that protect. You're the eyes and ears of the body of Christ and the mouthpieces that speak up against unrighteous activity. Are you going to play your role or are you going to hook up with the mischievous one, with the enemy? Whatever role that enemy is, whether it's demonic, whether it's circumstantial, whether it's emotional, whether it's verbal, or, you know, what are you going to do? Which side are you on? The side of the body of Christ? Or are you, <laughs> are you hanging out outside, outside the, the, uh, Oh boy, what is the word? Outside the court. Are you are you hanging out on the outskirts where the mischief is, where the lies are, where where the uh the unrest is, where there's always turmoil and turbulence and drama and attitude and you know, which one are you hanging out with? What are you gonna work with? See, the body of Christ is one. I don't care if you're in China or Russia, the body of Christ is one. Those of you who are in Australia, you're connected to me. I'm connected to you. We're all one. If we could only see that, if we could only fathom what Jesus is really saying, he said, I am the vine. You are the branches, which means we're all connected to the vine. And if you're not connected to the vine, baby, you're out there trying to fly solo, you're going to fall flat on your face because you need the body to circle the wagons. We protect each other in our unity. We protect and guard each other in our prayers. We protect and guard each other in love. But if you don't have the love of God in your heart, you better go back to God and check and see if you got anything in your heart from him. Because you can't be a child of the Most High King and not love your brothers and sisters. You can't be a child of the Most High King and talk about each other like you got 10 tails. You can't be a child of the Most High King and enjoy embarrassing your brothers and sisters in a big uh, 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 open, 
open a, a public arena and you're blam blasting them and cussing them out, tell them to go to hell and drop dead and all this other stuff. And they ain't about nothing. They ain't never going to be nothing and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, go jump and go play on the freeway. Just get out of my face. You're not even worthy of my breath. Come on now. Where's that coming from? It's not coming from God. God does not like seeing the, he does not like seeing the schisms. He doesn't like seeing strife. He doesn't want to see the wrath. He says in Psalms 37, forsake wrath. Forsake it. Cut that baby loose. You don't need it not in the body. See, there's a blood disease. I can't remember it now, but the Lord gave me the example years ago. You get a blood disease and it starts somewhere in your body. It starts. It has a starting point. But because that blood circulates throughout the whole body, before you know it, all the blood becomes contaminated. <laughs> oh my goodness. All the blood becomes contaminated. Okay, got it out. Now, once it's contaminated, I don't know if you call it sep septus, whatever, anyway, or staph infection or whatever, but there ends up being infection traveling throughout the body along with it. And with the infection comes a fever and things start to to malfunction in the body and organs start to break down. And sometimes people die from being in the hospital because one of those contaminants got in his blood. Do we want the body of Christ to wither away because of the contaminants we don't guard against? See, you must speak the truth in love. You see your brother or your sister. How many of us know there are brothers out there trying to get up under the skirts of the sisters? Hmm? You ain't saying a thing. You're just winking at it. No, you don't agree with mess. You don't cohabit with sin. Not if you're supposed to live a holy life. Not if you know Christ and Christ knows you. See, that's why in the end times, we're going to have a lot of people surprised when they go up on judgment day and Jesus looks at them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work in it quick tea. Going to be a lot of surprise and raised eyebrows. Wondering what the heck is going on. Mm -hmm. Oh, you get to know. Because one thing about God, he's going to play a video. You're going to see your whole life play. And you're going to know just why he, does, he chooses not to know you. Because you chose not to know him in holiness, in the power of his resurrection. Hmm. All right. Father, let me know if there's anything else you want me to say. We must lock arms, join arms. We must fight for each other, not fight each other. Hmm? We must love each other, not love putting down each other. We must work healing. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Are you praying for your brothers and sisters? Or are you praying on them? Which are you doing? Hmm. Backstabbing, smiling faces, sometimes pretend to be your friend, smiling faces, show no traces of the evil that lurks within. Smiling faces, smiling faces sometimes, they don't tell the truth. And I listen, 
I remember one time I was in church and this young brother, he couldn't have been no more than about 18 years old at the time. He sounded like a gossiping little old lady. Uh, he was like, yeah, uh, I was saying something nice about somebody. And he said, yeah, yeah, but you should see, you, know, you should see that mess his family is. That family is really a mess. I, I heard that his daughter got pregnant by so-and-so, and I heard that his son was 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 was, was caught up in this, that, and the other, and I heard blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at him like, really? I was too young of a Christian to know I was supposed to speak up then. But one good line, if you ever want to correct a brother or sister in Christ when they're right smack dab in the middle of the gossip thing, is say this. I don't think this conversation is glorifying God. Isn't that a good one? You know how I know that line? Because someone spoke it to me when I was running off at the mouth. And I'll never forget it. Because that stopped me dead in my tracks. And I saw myself. And I said, oh, what are you doing, girl? She's right. You're wrong. And I was like, Lord, forgive me. I told her, I said, thank you. I, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I'm running off at the mouth. This is something I should talk to the Lord about, not anybody else. You're right. I don't think this conversation is glorifying God. Memorize that. So if you hear one of your brothers or sisters flying off at the mouth, getting a little carried away, flying off with the flesh, put that check on it and see how they respond. Can't argue with truth. Not like that. That was so eloquently put. Hmm. Put me in my place. Will you be corrected? Hmm. Or will you just redirect your path and find somebody else with a garbage can for an ear? Guess what I heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's edify, not mortify. Please. The body of Christ, we are one not fragmented pieces. We are one. We're not the valley of dry bones. We are alive and we are one. Don't you ever forget it. Don't get so high and mighty that you forget who you're connected to. And don't get so big that you think you don't need the people in the body of Christ. There's always that one or two you think you don't need. Huh? You need them, baby. Much as you may not know it, you need them or they need you. God bless you. As we learn to edify in love.